to the channel Gran Colombia. Used to be called Cuenca, Ecuador because it was focused primarily on Cuenca, Ecuador with little trips from Cuenca. But it expanded. My trips became wider. I started uh, doing a lot of things in Colombia. So I called it Gran Colombia to encompass a, a broader area. And you found yourself at that channel. Now since we're going to talk about Ecuador again today, we'll put on the Panama hat, which is actually an Ecuador hat. See my video about it. Today's topic, we're going to talk about, you know what? I don't want to wear the hat. Today's topic is about changes in Cuenca, Ecuador, specifically Cuenca. I'm doing this video because it was posed to me. Somebody watched it actually two times in the last month. The same thing was brought up. Hey, I watched a couple of your videos and I found when I came to Cuenca that they're not really, it's not really the way you said it was. Well, the videos that they watched were almost three years old and things do change. And so I'm going to cover four of the big changes, things that I used to harp on going back three plus years ago, things I would harp on that have now changed. First one is the Tranvia. When I first arrived, the Tranvia had just, just started construction and it was a disaster. And year after year, it was a disaster. Downtown, it was, it was so painful for all those businesses downtown. Many of them went out of business. They just had to close their doors because people couldn't get to their business. They couldn't get deliveries of products. Trucks couldn't get in there. Roads were torn up and there was nothing you could do about it. They went broke. On Grand Columbia, you saw a number of businesses come and go. The only ones that seemed to survive were actually the really big ones supported by other businesses. So it, it, was, it was a mess and everything was torn up. But worse than that, money was stolen from that project like crazy. I don't remember the exact numbers, but you can look it up. It was going to be a hundred and something million dollars and it's, it's getting close to three hundred million dollars now. Now, what was that from? Well, you can imagine. There was a lot of graft, there was a lot of payoff, but one of the worst things that happened was the concrete. The concrete was a disaster. I've mentioned in the past about the lack of standards of construction in Ecuador in general. And when they did this concrete, a couple months later, you would see the concrete look like it was 10 years, 20 years, 30 years old. It was actually disintegrating, it was crumbling. On curbs where next to the road, if a car hit it here or there, it just took big chunks out of it. It was so porous that even the rain would cause all these pores to show up almost like a sponge. And you could see the little stones and pebbles in it. It was a disaster. And in a lot of places it just failed. So before the Tranvia even got on the tracks, before the tracks were even laid, they had to redo so much of what they had done. It was, it was a sad thing to watch. It was a mess. And people began to question whether it was ever going to get done. They, they missed deadline after deadline. There were promises after promises. I don't know how many experts they brought in from Spain and from France and from all these experts would come in that they would pay consulting fees to and nothing ever seemed to change. Well, lo and behold, the Tranvia is actually on the tracks and it's running. Uh, I, I knew eventually it would happen, but it just, it, be, it started to feel like it was never going to happen. So that's a big change. So there's going to be new patterns, there's going to be new traffic, there's going to be new areas that become very easy to get to, that become more popular. So that's a huge change. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. Personally, I'll go back to what I said three plus years ago. They would have been better off taking half of that money and just investing in hybrid buses of the smaller size. 
it, it would have resolved all of those issues that they have. But we're here now, we got the Tranvia, and that's yeah, it's nice, right? Big change. Change number two, the dogs. Now, I've been called out a couple times on this. You talked about all these packs of dogs, and I just never see them. Well, it's because you weren't there at the time when there were packs of dogs. My first year in Cuenca, uh, 15, 16, I lived on the seventh floor of the high rise, which is right near uh, Las Americas, uh, almost directly two blocks from the Corral Central. Beautiful building, four towers with a large courtyard in the middle. Wonderful place. I look out my picture window in the morning and there's Banos with the blue towered church, picturesque, just very nice place. But when I was there, I noticed it right away at night after midnight. I, I don't usually go to sleep until one or two in the morning and I tend to be up at four or five. It's, it's just a lifelong work addicted kind of person. So I noticed right away dogs after midnight. Now there are dogs, there were dogs during the day, but after midnight I noticed a lot of dogs and they'd be out barking. And I was seven floors up, but I had this uh, in my bedroom, sliding glass doors with a little balcony, and the noise would just translate right through them. They weren't um, insulated glass doors. So I mean, even though I'm seven floors up, it sounded like they're right next to me. So I hear these dogs. And I couldn't sleep. It was, I was like, I'm a light sleeper anyway, so it was problematic. So I would get up and stand on the balcony and I'd look down and I'd see these dogs and I could see over the, over the area of a number of blocks, I could see down and there were street lights. So I could see what was going on and there'd be these groups of dogs and these groups of dogs would, would congregate. And I tried to count one day because there were so many and it was the number, the count I got was somewhere around 40. It was very loud, all different kinds. And what they're doing, they're just breaking into the trash cans that would sit up high and they were having sex everywhere. And just, uh, you'd have these little fights and skirmishes. And it was packs of dogs. During the day, you would see a lot of these dogs, but they're, you know, they tend to stay up at night and then you'd see them sleeping on the sidewalk during the day. And these dogs were filthy, they were unkempt, their hair is all matted. These were neglected dogs and puppies that came from those dogs. And all around the city, it was a problem. You would see story after story of somebody who was attacked by a dog, bitten by a dog. It was epidemic, literally epidemic problem. Now what came out of that was a number of things. You had people that would put together dog shelters. They would try to raise money, use their own money. And to this day, there's some of these dog shelters. There's one guy, Mauricio, that keeps about 100 dogs on hand at any given time. I got a rescue dog from him. You know, it was a sad situation. So you had these good Samaritans that tried to do something about it. And then later, and I did an entire video on this uh, down in Hiron, you had a group of uh, veterinary doctors in training, volunteering their time, uh, put together by some gringos, and they would go in groups to these areas or different towns and do spay and neutering. And there were donations taken, I think it was $20. So dog owners would spay and neuter their pets so that they wouldn't have these puppies and you know the whole story. I think the video is called Bob Barker Special or something because of the spay and neuter. So you had that as contributing to a solution. Now one thing that very few people actually know, I'm a little surprised, but the government in Cuenca decided to do something. Now in Loja they talked about it and it was public, it was in the newspaper and there was an outcry. But they decided to do it in Cuenca and they didn't publicize it. Now, what is that? Well, at night, after midnight, trucks would go out, little box trucks would go out and they would collect these dogs. 
and on the north end of town near where the Las Americas meet up there there's a junkyard area if you've ever been up there in that area they would take them up there and they would euthanize they would kill those dogs the stray dogs so it didn't take very long and it was literally a matter of months it was less than a year where those packs of dogs didn't really exist like that anymore now nobody said a word and I'm sure that a lot of people have caught on but in general people are really glad because they were really becoming a nuisance it was a real problem and now you have these solutions like them or not these solutions have added up to the fact that this dog issue doesn't exist anywhere like it did three years ago and back so that's the second thing that's changed third thing that's changed how many videos did I do railing about the food? You couldn't get good beef. You couldn't find decent bacon. You couldn't find edible cheese. We come from a culture, I came from a culture, and we like those things. And of course you can get along without it. Of course you can. But, you know, I didn't want to. I, I like those things. You know, there's certain things in life you enjoy. There's nothing like a good hamburger. I mean, I love a good hamburger at least once in a while. And I can make them at home, but the beef I would buy just tasted horrible. And the meat, the beef you would buy, if you bought a steak, it was tough as shoe leather. It had this weird farm taste, barnyard manure taste. I don't know what it was. It was just a bad taste. And the hamburgers were atrocious. I worked for quite a while trying to figure out spices ways I could dress it up to take away that taste and I found that but you would go out and get burgers in town and they would just be awful and there's some that cared like Inca they actually it's it wasn't at the time it wasn't just beef they used a, a little concoction it had a little bit of filler in it and so you could get a burger there and it tasted pretty good it wasn't it wasn't like having a hundred percent Angus beef, but it was pretty good. But for the most part, nobody cared. And so if you wanted a good hamburger, as an example, and you would go out and hit the town and you could try 50 different places and you might find one or two that were really good. I actually did the hamburger wars, the burger wars, as we were coming out of that phase and found a number of places with some decent burgers. Bacon. I was on search for good bacon, and it took a while, but actually an Ecuador company started making a smoked bacon. Uh, Fritz brand started making a smoked bacon that was the kind of bacon I wanted that you could cook and crisp up, and it was the bacon that we know and love. So I was very happy, but prior to that, try to find a good bacon. It was... It wasn't really, what they called bacon wasn't really the bacon that we wanted. There was an enterprising gringo that put together this little business and because you couldn't find good bacon, he was smoking and making his own bacon. And it was okay, it was pretty decent, but it wasn't quite there until the Fritz came along and it was 100% there. So I did some videos on that. And cheese, getting a good cheese was really challenging. Now today, there's a lot of uh, there's a number of companies in Ecuador that have realized that and they've been frantically working over the past few years trying to come up with good cheeses like cheddar cheese and blue cheese that don't have that horrible taste to them. And there's been changes in the laws where imports are now permitted that weren't permitted before and the import taxes on things that were permitted before but were taxed so high have, have come way down or in a few cases actually completely eliminated. You can walk into Super Maxi now and you can buy a Danish blue cheese for example that's just like you want it to be. That didn't exist three years ago. That, that, that's a change. You've had changes in beef sources. You've had uh, an explosion of new and good quality restaurants beginning uh, in 2017. 
and it carried into 2018. There's so many new restaurants that are of very high quality, which didn't exist prior to that. It was hard to find a good place to eat. You could find lots of places to eat. It just wasn't very good. Nobody paid attention to cleanliness or the quality of the ingredients, and that's changed. So you can get good bacon, you can get good beef, you can get good cheese, you can go out to good restaurants, and you don't have to spend half your life searching for it. And number four, I just alluded to, the taxes. The import taxes, that entire structure has changed. With the trade agreement with Europe, those taxes have dramatically dropped or disappeared. So be it on liquor, if you want a London gin, for example, or Bombay gin, you can buy it for about a third of the price of what it used to be. The cheeses that I just mentioned, they're not only reasonably priced, but more so they're actually available you can actually buy them where you could not buy them before. It's altered cost of living information I talked about three years ago. Now primarily the only things that were uh, cheap in Cuenca was rent, somewhat utilities, although in some cases not much different than the US, and uh, raw foods. Uh, you know, you go down to the Mercado and you get your fruits and vegetables, those things were dirt cheap. But anything else, like TV, I'll give you just one example. When I got to Ecuador, I wanted to get a TV. I wanted something around a 40 inch range. I wasn't dead set on it, but I wanted a decent brand. So I went out, looked at a number of different places. I asked my friend Maria, she said, oh, I'll go to this place, it's probably the best. So I did all of that. The cheapest TV I could find was right around $1,000. Now there was one place that I was told would negotiate and I ended up getting a TV for I think it was closer to $700. I actually had to walk away and I got a call back after I got back to my apartment and then I went back and bought it the next day. But $700 for a 40 inch TV, which at the time you could buy them in the US for between three and $400. So it was pretty, you know, pretty steep. That's just one example. Uh, everything, it, coffee maker, an $18 coffee maker cost me $78. Uh, it, it, there were just so many things like that. Before I left Cuenca to come here to Colombia, I went to a TV store. And I may still have the clips, although I've lost a bunch of clips that I was saving for future videos, but I'll, I'll look and see if I have it. But I intentionally went to look at TVs. And the very same type, only three years newer, TV, no longer had that import tax, and that TV was selling for just over $300. Huge difference. Huge difference. It was about a third of the cost of what they were when I originally got to Cuenca. A third of the cost. Now you carry that over clothes, uh, other appliances, waffle makers, uh, microwaves, clothes washers. You carry it across all of those things and your cost of living would jump way up because if your rent was half the price but everything else is three times the price, you know, you're going to come down to where it might be your cost of living would still be better than if you lived in San Francisco, but maybe it wasn't as good as where I used to live in upstate New York. I mean, it was like that. Well, now what's happened with this tax change is the cost of living has actually come down from what it was a number of years back. That's a good thing. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, so where you might have lived a certain lifestyle on $1,500 a month, you can now live that same type of lifestyle, maybe closer to the thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars, somewhere in there. It it definitely affects it. The cost of living, the feeling of it, was always skewed because you could go out and get two, three, four dollar lunches. So you saw that every day, and it's like, oh my God, where where can you go and get three dollar lunches like this? And 
the fact that you would pay rent and it might only be three hundred, four hundred dollars for something you might pay closer to a thousand dollars for, you know, in the U.S. or or more. So those things just gave you this impression. Oh my God, it's so cheap! I get in a taxi; it's two dollars to go here to there. And it's so cheap, but in total, as you lived your life there and you had to do other things, you come to realize that the cost of living isn't just the rent. This has greatly affected that cost of living, all for the, all for the good. It doesn't mean that Cuenca is cheap. Cuenca is probably still the most expensive city in Ecuador, but relatively speaking, it's, it's become a better place to live financially. Uh, you still need to weigh it out. It's, it's the most deceptive, not in an intentional way, but it's the most deceptive thing to feel, the cost of living there, because there's no direct comparison. So it takes time to figure out what the cost of living is there. Whereas you go to a place like Colombia, there's direct comparisons. You can figure out the cost of living like right away. You don't have uh, wild taxes or certain laws and restrictions that alter what the economy is. Um, so keep that in mind. So those are four big things. The Tranvia is finally operating. Dogs, problem in hand. Food, good quality food, good quality restaurants available almost on every street corner now. The taxes, the import taxes, eliminated or greatly reduced. So that's my changes in Cuenca, Ecuador. Hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next video. If you like this channel and you want to support it, see the comment section down below. You can contribute through Patreon, GoFundMe, or direct through Google Pay. If you're planning a trip or a move to the coffee area of Columbia, contact me from the email. As always, subscribe and like, and thank you for watching.